First, I want to say to you and to your family, Happy New Year. And from my family to yours, we wish you the very best and God's blessing upon every day of your life in 2013. Work, work, work. That's all I ever do. I have to work and slave to keep the house clean. I work my fingers to the very bone to put good meals on the table. I work to keep everything straightened up around here and nobody notices. Does this sound familiar? A lot of women feel this way. These words are spoken all the time. And if in this new year you're approaching it feeling downtrodden, overworked, overburdened, and unappreciated, and just basically tired, I have some heartening news for you. You are not alone. But with God's help, you can come to the other side. Luke 10, 38 through 42. It says this, Now it happened as they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with so much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. It is talking about spirituality. And ever since that time, theologians... Bible scholars have tended to downplay Martha's work and elevate Mary's spiritual focus. Some have even insisted that this is the biblical support necessary to having women ordained in the clergy. We understand that sitting at the feet of Jesus is understanding our own spiritual awareness by learning from the Master. And we can sit at the feet of Jesus in prayer. But right now I want to take up Martha's case with you. Many of Martha's struggles are mirrored in that comic strip called Peanuts. Charlie Brown is talking with Linus, and he says, You know, Linus, it goes all the way back to the beginning. The moment that I set foot on this stage of life, they took one look at me and they said, not right for the part. <laughs> well, many of us feel that perhaps others feel that way about us, that we're just not right for the part. How many of us, like Charlie Brown, stand looking into life's mirror on a daily basis and come up with a feeling not right for the part. For example, the role of being a parent to teenagers or being a business mover and shaker or a parent with multiple responsibilities makes you many times feel not right for the part. It's also Charlie Brown who complains to Linus about his publisher saying that the publisher sent him a rejection slip. Linus says, that's all right, Charlie Brown. Lots of people get rejection slips. <laughs> Charlie Brown, Brown replied, but I haven't even submitted a manuscript. Many theologians have said, that Martha represents experience or practice, while Mary stands for protection or conservation of that which is already in and established, really boils down to two main areas, spiritually and physically, practice or conservation. Here's a story about that. Jesus tells another interesting parable 
about a businessman. And the businessman is going away on a trip and he leaves three servants in charge. He gives them some money to care for while he's gone. And he says, when I come back, we will have an accounting. When he returns, he turns to the first servant and he says, what have you done with the five talents that I gave you? He replied, well, I went out and I doubled them. And the man said, fantastic. Then he turned to the next servant. Now, before I go to the next servant, let me assure you that a talent was an enormous sum of money in those days. A talent would be equal to about 75 pounds of pure silver, depending on how you look at it and how you count it. It's a tremendous sum of money. So he says to the servant who had two talents, what did you do with the two talents that I gave you? And the servant replied, well, sir, I made you a 100% improvement. And he said, fantastic. Then he turned to the third servant and he asked, what did you do with the one talent that I gave you? And the servant said, sir, I wasn't sir, sure what to do with it. So I was a bit afraid, so I buried it. According to the standards of the day, what do you think the hearers of this parable would, would hear as far as Jesus' words were concerned? How many opt for the servant who had the 100% increase? How many would opt for the servant who doubled the talents? How many would opt for the one that wasn't sure what to do. And so, frightened, he buried it. Many respect the MBAs and the Wizards of Wall Street who dabble in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and securities. But in those days, there were no savings and loan institutions. There were no banks. There were crises and there were wars that could pop up at any time. So it's possible that the people who were listening to this parable of Jesus were very, very influenced by that third servant. They might think the first two servants were being reckless, especially doing this with someone else's money. They might think that the third servant was more prudent than the other two. Dabbling around with money, even by today's standards, can be a rather risky business. There's always a possibility, of course, that Jesus was also referring to Israel's religious heritage in this parable. This raises the question, what do you do with your religion? Do you preserve it? Or do you practice it? Those are two opposite things. For years, the followers of the Torah had to protect their faith from invasion from all sides, first from the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. The Greeks, in particular, were defilers of the temple in their attempt to Hellenize that part of the Mideast. It's no wonder the rabbis taught that to be religiously faithful, one had to defend the faith. One had to hold on to it, to protect it, even by hiding it. Do you remember the wonderful story of Anne Frank during World War II and the Holocaust? In a higher and a more spiritual sense, Religion, as seen through the eyes of Jesus in this parable, could also refer to something more than just something to, to talk about, more than something between me and God. Religion, seen in his eyes, 
is to invest, to use, to practice, to share, to splurge, and even to risk. It's definitely not something to sit on, to bury, to shelve, to can, to preserve, to freeze, or even pass along to someone else in the next generation. Jesus also said, By their fruit ye shall know them, by what is produced, not by what is promised. So the only question Jesus is going to ask is this, what have we done with what has been given to us to invest and to share to make this world a little better place for humanity? It's a serious question to ask ourselves as we go into a new year. What are we doing with this that has been given to us by God? And what are we going to do? What have we done in the past? There was a recent headline from a newspaper that caught my eye. It said he finally gets what he gave up. The subheading is teen who bought van for a stranger buys his car with the help for, from others. And there is a picture of a 16-year-old boy standing in front of his new Honda Accord. And what a smile he had on his face. In July, he attended an American Cancer Society auto auction. He had $1,500 in his pocket to get a used car. What he found was a woman with Lou Gehrig's disease, weeping because she couldn't afford the $3,700 price tag for the van that she wanted and needed to get around. So the boy put down his $1,500, and the mother put down the difference. And then he bought the van, and he gave it to this woman. Well, the people who th saw this on television, they were touched. They applauded. They cried. After the story appeared in many newspapers, funds rolled in from everywhere. Enough to more than purchase a vehicle. Radio talk shows interviewed him. More than 600 cards and letters came to him. And donations to the Boys Trust Fund build up. All he said he was trying to do was to help someone, which is the basic ingredient of service. It is the basic ingredient of Martha's work. See, both, both Martha and Mary had valuable spiritual work to do. Martha had a purpose just as Mary had a purpose that evening. We would often talk about this in the church there are some people that stand on stage giving the sermon. And there are other people that clean out the restrooms. But each are doing a valuable and a needed service that must be done. This planet of ours is absolutely starved for kindness. This earth of ours is virtually crying out for compassion. Yes, I know that Martha represents that part of us that is so easily distracted and frustrated and feels overworked. It's almost impossible for us not to complain about something for any length of time. I also know that, biblically speaking, Mary has chosen what one translation calls the right portion. But that doesn't downplay Martha's work at all. She and Mary are sisters. They're part of the same house. What they represent must have equal importance because of this interrelationship. Martha then gives her service externally while Mary's devotion is internal. The point is that both are important ingredients that are absolutely necessary for our own spiritual growth and development in consciousness. They are part and parcel of our spiritual makeup and 
composition in the soul. Doing spiritual work is applying what we know spiritually and then serving. It is so much more important than just talking about it or discussing it. I know people that have been very spiritual that have never walked the talk. We must do both. We must have both Martha and Mary inside of us. And we have always been confronted with that age-old question, which is more important, being or doing? You have to be a human being first before you can be a human doing. You have to know the truth before you can apply it. Jesus said this in so many words. It isn't the truth that sets us free. It is knowing the truth sets us free. I believe the essential is the I do ingredient. Here is what I call choice. My life up to this very point is based on what I have said yes to and also what I have said no to. The definite maybes, <laughs> they can't be counted. The power of choice is an executive power of the mind, the will in the human. How do we know whether we're on target with this? How do we know whether we're going to be willful or willing? There's a huge difference. What if we lived life backwards, my friend? Sometimes we try to do that. Maybe we think about what it would have been like if we should uh, die first and then get that out of the way. And then you live for 20 years in an old age home and then you get kicked out when you're too young. Remember the story of Benjamin Button? And you get a gold watch and then you go to work. And you work for 40 years until you are young enough to enjoy your retirement. Then you go to college until you're ready for high school. And then you go to grade school and you become a little kid and you play. You have no responsibilities and you become a baby boy. You step back into the womb. You spend the last nine months floating as you finish off as a gleam in someone's eye. There's another subtle but highly important point here in this situation with Martha. What the world needs now more than anything is this. The world needs shakers. The world needs movers. The world needs doers. I have seen, even in my short lifetime, more people sitting on the sidelines and criticizing the game of life and what other people are playing. It is important that we get into the game, and especially in 2013. This is one of the key reasons why I feel that Martha perhaps has been shortchanged. Didn't Jesus also say, those who are going to get into the kingdom of heaven are those who do the will of my Father. And everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them shall be likened to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, which is the concluding parable on the Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew 7. The epistle of James adds, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, and deceiving your own selves. This again is a conscious choice. But as we go into this new year, we have to decide 
in our spirituality not just to listen, not just to attend church, but to become active, to become a participant, to become a volunteer, to, to become active as a doer. And as we allow God's loving actions to work through us, we will be a real blessing to others. In another story, Martha becomes the central figure. That story has to do with the raising of her brother, Lazarus, from the dead. She is the one Jesus encounters as he's coming into Bethany. It is she who asked the provocative question by uh, Jesus, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? Well, there is no doubt in her mind whatsoever. And she says, yea, Lord, I do believe you are the Christ the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's from the Gospel according to John. It is she who leads the way to the tomb cave where Lazarus is buried. She just may have been instrumental in helping to roll away that guardian stone. Scripture only says that they took away the stone without identifying specifically who they are. So not only does Martha express faith, but I say, my friend, it is a working faith. Yes, I believe that I am going to help roll that stone away. That's what I believe that she would have said. And she wouldn't have just sat back waiting for other people to do it. I know sometimes we get fatigued in life, especially the ladies that are balancing everything they have to balance. But when you allow God's help to come through you, you are able to be a doer without the fatigue of the doing. You actually get more energy as you go along. Stephen Covey, in the seven habits of effective people says to begin any overcoming or any personal or private triumph it begins with one word that one word is being proactive proactive is much more than just taking the initiative it is also the responsibility to do this as well. As we choose to look forward and not backward at the beginning of 2013, we ask ourselves this question. Are we going to be proactive or reactive? There's a huge difference between the two, but most people are reactive. And when you're proactive, you are needed everywhere. Are you going to cause things to happen or are you going to be on the receiving end only of the happening? Are you going to be affected by the weather? Are you going to take the weather along with you wherever you go? Are you going to be affected by social weather of others? Or are you going to be empowered by God to to? really make a difference. I believe you can because I believe in you. Covey even goes as far as to suggest a 30-day litmus test of faith, what I call the Martha factor. By making small commitments one at a time and keeping them of being judge but being light being a model and not being a critic, being a part of the solution and not part of the problem. People who exercise their freedom day after day, little by little, expand upon this freedom. People who do not find that it withers away until they're literally being lived, 
since they are acting out scripts written by other people, such as parents, associates, and society. We have come to a place now where we search for God, and we must no longer just be searching for the rewards. It must no longer be seeking other people to follow, but it must be living a full life for ourselves. So let's get Martha and Mary together in our own life in our prayer time. Let's begin praying with our feet moving. Love to serve and to show it. And when you do, wherever you are in 2013, you will make a difference. You will be a doer, not just a hearer. May God bless you every day of your life in 2013, and others will be blessed by knowing you, because everyone is attracted to a doer.